Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the morning session. Um, we're going to have two talks as, as yesterday, and uh, we're delighted to have Jeff Kimball talk about atoms and photons. I'll make sure that you have 40 minutes. Well, I'm <laughs> The first rule in life is never trust the, <laughs> never trust the, the chair. session chair. That's right. <laughs> <Very strong. laughs> so there's a quick outline. The whole thing is going to be about nanophotonics and how they combine atoms, cold atoms, and nanophotonic structures. And I want to thank all the members of my group. It's been really a struggle over the last few years for graduate students and postdocs to be in my lab or come to my lab and it's like, uh, well, well, I want to do CAVI QED, we don't do that anymore. I want to do DLCZ, we don't do that anymore. Um, so uh, it's been really challenging and th these people are the ones who've made it happen. I just want to start with a mo well, one moment of, uh, I was struck in the talks that some people think CAVI QED is zero D. Zero dimensional. And I've never thought of CAVI QED that way. I've always thought of it as a way to, you know, get light in and out essentially uh, of uh, atoms and to solve this problem of light going into three dimensions. And it's, since my days in graduate school of trying to see photon statistics, it's a pain in the ass to collect fluorescence and try to do quantum optics with it. So a long time ago, we published this paper about, hey, we want to make one dimensional atoms. We, we didn't have a waveguide. We had collimated beams. But the collimated beams are the you know, waveguides of free space. So. I've never thought of CAVI QED as Z or D. In, in the optical domain, you know, light gets in and out. And along the way, quantum optics has learned, you know, input-output formalisms. That's essential, but this little gadget to me is always something you put in a waveguide. On the other hand, it's got a lot of uh, conventional CAVI QED, and a lot of AMO physics has uh, problems with efficiency, with coupling. So what I've been working on for a while is to try to integrate uh, uh, nanophotonics and, uh, and uh, atomic physics. And the, the, the motivation is clear. Uh, you know, 10 to the 6 is pretty straightforward to get for the quality factors in these little dielectric structures. 10 to the 7 has been demonstrated. You can get efficient input-output coupling. Kerry Vahala in his nano, in his microspheres, has, has measured 99.97. Can you believe that? So, uh, so there's just all kinds of different dielectrics. Metal is evil, so uh, no uh, 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 plasmonics. And, and what we'd like to do is give these uh, just remarkable technical wonders of quantum functionality by putting atoms in it. So that's the simple story. And, you know, relative to free space atoms, we get a big optical depth. Uh, in cavity QED, uh, you can reach uh, critical photon numbers that are just unheard of. So it seems like there's really a you know, quantitative improvement in the kind of coupling we get. But one of the things I want to emphasize is the qualitatively new physics we can do. It's not just the same stuff smaller. It's really new frontiers. And so this, this is something you'll know about. This is something you'll know about. But quantum mini-body physics are really just different things we can do in the way light and matter interact with this, and, and this is just some cartoon. Everything I'll tell you about today is photonic, but you'll know of Oscar Painter's spectacular work to really harness phonons in these structures. So uh, I think we have a, a, a possibility to finally do atoms, photons, and phonons all in the same setting. So the, the star of the show is going to be the rear end of this guy. Uh, that structure we reproduce in this little nanophotonic thing. We call them alligator uh, photonic crystal wave guides. And this thing is designed so that we can fabricate it and have atom trapped in it and the atom be somewhat insensitive to the fabrication errors, which live out here mostly. These are just planar surfaces. So if there's a little defect, this atom sees kind of an average of these defects. So it helps a lot with the, with the uh, wet chemistry of, you know, etching things away and making really nice structures. Um, so what can we do with it? Well, if we put an atom in there, I think it's completely reasonable to, to, uh, to achieve uh, excited atom. 90% um, of the radiation, that's this ratio, goes into the waveguide and gamma prime into all other modes, including lossy modes and guided modes I'm not interested in, but they're counted in this gamma prime, that we can make that ratio 10 to 1. 
Uh, that means that one atom can be a 90% reflector and, and uh, transmit, uh, you know, only 1% uh, of light, say. And the atom's a quantum reflector. It has hyperfine levels. We make quantum superbitions and so on. So that's interesting. Um, strong coupling in CAVI QED, you'll hear more about in uh, Jeff Thompson's work. But uh, next, the single photon Rabi frequency is, you know, at almost two orders of magnitude bigger than what you'll ever get in more conventional structures, including a toroid. Call that a conventional structure. Um, but something that you might not have thought of in the first instance, so that just so the volumes are small, so the electric field is big for one atom, is that we can do something in these structures that you can never do in free space, and that's we can make two frequencies. This is just a simple diagram of a band structure. We can have two frequencies have the same length scale. So if we trap with one frequency and then a very different frequency, we do the atom photon physics. They can have the same length scale, or would you like it to be 2 to 1? Or would you like it to be square root of pi? Um, you, you just can't do that in free space. So it gives us tremendous flexibility. The other thing's already been mentioned in the talks. If we go near the band edge, in particular, I've learned about this physics through Peter Lodl's work, you, you get this group velocity going to zero in a really enhanced, uh, simple way to say it's density of states. So you can get an enhanced coupling of an atom uh, emitting into the waveguide. If you now take that one atom and it's a big uh, attenuator, strong interactions in this sense, and try to propagate light in this waveguide, then then you know everybody knows about the photons. There's really large, uh, at some level, many body physics associated with photon transport, photon transport, which I'll mention in a while, and that leads to this quantum, the opportunities for quantum many body physics. I'm also quite interested in these little bitty spaces that, to think that we could really get serious about measuring uh, vacuum forces, Kessler-Polder forces, with these structures. So let's start out in the band diagram. Uh, K, the projected wave vector along this direction, and the associated omega, and this periodicity and patterning here, two beams with holes in them, gives rise to a band gap. And we'll put the atomic frequency in this dispersive regime. Doesn't matter if it's up here or down here. It's, it's, Freely propagating, you know, either I omega t minus uh, kx. So what can we do? Well, an atom here can, in the excited state, spin up, uh, emit a photon, and that photon can be absorbed over here to flip a spin. Or here to here, or here to everywhere. This is essentially infinite range in the way it's drawn. It, the range is limited only by retardation. So there's a conservative Hamiltonian um, shown here. And this, this thing is just, in this setting, it's just, you know, uh, um, very long range. Uh, this has the structure of a block mode in the way I've drawn it if we go to the band edge. There's also incoherent evolution where instead of these two atoms doing a spin flips, uh, coherently this, uh, this guy can flip down and then we can have a uh, super radiant or, uh, emission. So if we place the atoms at special spacing, say the propagation phase from here to here is pi or two pi or something like that, this, this term is zero. So uh, we can have just this incoherent evolution. And let's talk about that. So that's the atom emitting here. That's the loss channel or into the waveguide. And so, okay, it's uh, spontaneous emission. It's described by this Lindblad. Uh, but uh, we can still do good things. So the phenomenology that I mentioned before is here's this reflective. You send light in, and the reflectivity and the transmissivity of an atom in this waveguide it's just governed by how big is this gamma 1d compared to the other loss rates. There's a little impedance mismatch associated with light propagation. And so um, that is the kind of figure of merit I'll use throughout the talk. And it's just the Einstein A coefficient times how well you can concentrate the light, the radiative cross section divided by what the area is here. And then, well, you win because the group velocity at the band edge gets slower and slower, so there's longer time for the interaction. Um, this effective area is something you have to think about. It's real important to worry about the polarization, the, the kind of atomic physics we want to do, both for trapping and interacting. But anyway, there's some simple expression for this effective area. So the ex two examples of this that are, we've heard about that are uh, well known is, is uh, uh, you know, an atom near uh, a uh, cylindrical waveguide, uh, SiO2, make the, you know, a few hundred nanometers diameter. And if you put the atom right at the surface, then the best coupling you'll ever get is this, in terms of this ratio, is 20% absorption per atom. 
if you, not at the surface, but what you can do with the dipole force traps, forts and fibers like this, that, we'll, that we have heard about and we'll hear about, uh, pioneered by Arno Rashibutl, is 5% uh, absorption. Um, by contrast, if you make use of the smaller uh, area here, the mode area, and the group velocity, it's completely reasonable to have this reflection coefficient be 0.9 and then this ratio is like that. So you just compare, that's in, you know, with regular forts, a couple hundred nanometers from the surface, or in a fort here, which isn't so regular, but anyway, there's just a qualitative difference in the kind of uh, coupling we can get. So that's the goal. And what can you do with that? Well, if you trap an atom in a waveguide like this, or near a waveguide like this, then in Jeff Thompson's work, which you just hear about, that atom then is going to be uh, an atom for cavity QED. So we'll make a cavity. The mirrors Jeff will tell you about, they're not uh, mirrors like this, but there's you know, simple storage like that. So you get some volume, you have some coupling, and then you could ask, for example, how big is this coupling coefficient? Twice that's the vacuum Rabi frequency. So you can get numbers, as I said before, which are spectacularly large. And this g squared uh, divided into the dissipation rate gives you this uh, squared, gives you this, uh, how many photons do you need to saturate? And so um, that's just amazing. Uh, in, in this structure, the one Jeff will tell you about, the projection is to go from what I think is the best we could have done ever in microtoroids. So they're already pretty small, uh, two orders of magnitude in this way. So this is quantitatively better in terms of the strength of all the interactions. Um, let's look at another possibility. Here's the atom. Now we want to do cavity QED. I just explained to you that the, the atoms can be good reflectors. So instead of regular nanophotonic patterning, we'll end up with a mirror which is just an atom, and then we'll, uh, we'll put an atom in the middle. So that's cavity QED. Uh, except the mirrors are already quantum, so I don't need the atom in the middle. I just have these quantum mirrors, so this is cavity QED, where this is a quantum mirror, this is a quantum mirror, and that's not just smaller, that's qualitatively different, the kind of physics that emerges. For example, as this mirror moves around, the atom has a center of mass degree of freedom. Uh, it takes the mirror with it. So you in inherently uh, involve the, the quantum character of the reflection of the cavity, so there's a very unique, I think, kind of optomechanics feature where the optomechanical element is, is the mirror, which is an atom. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So a kind of traditional outlook on how you move quantum information stored in atomic states from place to place is a, is a toy diagram like that. But uh, Derek Chang and, uh, and the Harvard Mafia, who we, we actually had a, at Caltech, they were in a retraining program uh, <laughs> to, to really you know, fix the problems they got on the, at another institution. Uh, it was a very exciting time thinking about what you can you do with atoms trapped first in nanophotonic uh, waveguides and then in photonic crystals. And one of the things is just this, all the protocols you can do with this, you can do with atoms along a nanofiber like that. So that was a really exciting time. Uh, instead of this waveguide, let's go to a photonic crystal and things then get even better. This coupling, gamma 1D, gets bigger compared to the dissipation. So... Uh, um, Alejandro Gonzalez Tudela and colleagues in, Eric, in uh, Inacio Chirac's group have shown how in a dissipative regime where gamma 1D is really big, you can make pure states. So these live in a decoherence-free subspace. Here it's five spins excited in ground state. You would really do this in a lambda system. Um, and that's what's worked out here. And you can make arbitrary uh, quantum states of the spin. That's already pretty interesting. And the quality of the states depends on how big the dissipation is. So we get gamma 1D really, really big. And having made those sp the, such a state as that, one can efficiently map that state to a propagating light field. Map it out and map it back, just like in this kind of circumstance. But I think we are show, we have a manuscript that we'll soon post, which shows that you can do better than, in terms of the errors, the, the infidelity of the process, than you can do in traditional cavity QED. So that would be great. It's, it's reversible just like this uh, in principle, and so we can make interesting quantum states, send them into the world, and bring them back. And so we can regain some measure of pride relative to these, uh, these scurrilous circuit QED people who've had such spectacular progress making you know, really complicated states of the electromagnetic field. 
And uh, in quantum optics, we're proud of you know one photon or maybe occasionally two clicks. But so we need to be do we need to do better at making and measuring uh, quantum states of light. So I think there's a good outlook for that. So here's another regime, atoms trapped in an antiphotonic waveguide. Here's the band structure. And, and now let's do something you wouldn't have thought to do, and that's to put the atom atomic frequency inside the gap. Well, there are no propagating modes now. The modes are exponentially attenuated in a 1D waveguide. So around the atom, there's this little cloud of a photon that was first considered by John and Wang and by Gershon Krasinski a long time ago. Makes this little bound state. In absence of gamma prime, that's the eigenstate of the system. It just sits there like that, or absent losses in the dielectric. That little cloud is what's kind of indicated here. And so you think, well, so what? Well, in terms of the language I just gave you, in these photonic crystals, there's block mode stuff that tells you the spatial structure, tells you about this envelope. And then there's dissipative stuff associated with the guided mode, the guided mode dissipation. And inside the gap, this localization, the, the, I, the uh, imaginary part of a Green's function for this is this attenuated region. So this guy's gone. So now you can have just spin, spin physics limited only by the dissipation of the waveguide and the, and the gamma prime. And, I, and that leads to the possibility to do interesting uh, quantum, quantum mini-body models. And I won't talk about that. There are two, two presentations later today uh, that uh, um, are two leading figures in, in you know, figuring out what can you do, both with atoms, spin-spin interactions, and with photons, propagating photons uh, when the... When the uh, Atom uh, transition sits inside the band gap like that. So that's kind of the theoretical overview of this 1D stuff. Let me go then to what well, the alligator in some more detail. I've shown you uh, electron micro micrographs like that. So we had to work to get the light in and out of this. We use a, a conventional optical fiber. You can just barely see right here. There's a little tip. It's about um, 200 nanometers diameter, 100 nanometers wide. And we mode match the six micron beam in the core of a fiber into the little, uh, this little B wave gun. Oscar's group uh, developed that, and uh, we, we, they've achieved 90%. We think we do similarly. We've then got to get the light all the way over here to this guy. This is all suspended, so this, the background here is just free space, and this is the dielectric. So we've got to do that with low loss. Uh, we've got to keep this thing from burning up, so we have ways to conduct the heat. We've got to keep it from snapping. It's under a gigapascal of stress, so we've got to deal with that. So there's a number of problems we had to solve, but in the end, um, in the end, we're able to build these quite reliably, and now the goal is to trap atoms and do physics with them. This is what the little chip looks like. There are a number of devices. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, and here's a fiber going in to talk to one of them, and that, that's what's going to go into the vacuum chamber. Um, Light goes in, light goes out of this little device, and uh, uh, how do we understand what's going on from the measurements? The modeling for this has all been done by John Hood, a uh, former student of uh, Luis Orozco. So as you tune the frequency towards the band edge, you get transmission, and then boom, nothing comes out. And this stop band in our, for our devices is better than 40 dB. So they really, they're really uh, do what they're supposed to. These oscillations are that when the light comes in, this impedance matching taper the just increases in modulation amplitude, there is reflection. That happens at both ends. That reflectivity is about 40%. So it's a very low finesse cavity. For, for my life in cavity QD, it's, it's embarrassing. But we want that to go to zero because we just want the waveguide. Nonetheless, we have these reflections. And the model that John's come up with uh, does really well at telling us where the band gap is and what the reflectivity is. So if you take the model, given this fit that seems okay, and you take that model, then you can in infer what is the group velocity here. Uh, the group index is about 11, so it, that means the velocity is C over 11. And what's the reflectivity of these tapering sections? And the reflectivity of these tapering sections is 40 45%. Um, so we think we understand that, the device on its own. We've looked at, you can look at this when light goes through. You can look at the scattering. We've done all kinds of measurements to try to validate. We don't see at the level we're able to do things now. Uh, any, never have we seen light localization due to disorder inside the photonic crystal. So, um, so now we take that device, and this is an optical trap. So we're going to trap atoms in a little tube here. So we bring light in and reflect off. And very much in the spirit of uh, Jeff Thompson's work. And what do we get for this? 
We get a dipole force trap that along here is about 50 microns, and uh, we trap atoms with temperature about 30 microkelvin. In somewhat more detail, if you look at this photonic crystal, it's coming out of the page at you. When you reflect the light about lambda by 4, if it were just uh, lambda by 2, if it were just a, um, a um, no, lambda by 4, uh, you get a bright spot if it were just a plane. So you've got to do the real calculation of the reflectivity from this, and then you get a little bright spot, and you get another bright spot, and so on. So that's where the trap is. So that tube represents this along the axis. And then you can say, um, well, what about atoms? So the atoms are trapped along here like that. So an atom could be trapped here. We bring atoms in, and we cool. Atom could be trapped there. We bring atoms in, and we cool. We, we, we can't control that. This is a red fort, so a tomb below resonance. Uh, this is the same beam coming out of the page at you, and you can ask, where does the atom need to be to have this gamma 1D? That's the measure of the coupling rate for this talk compared to the Einstein A coefficient. And the, the answer is, if you're trapped here, you're reasonably well coupled in this color scale. If you're trapped here, you're not so well coupled. And in fact, that ratio of how big is gamma 1D here to gamma 1D, there's 100 to 1. So every one of these little trapping sites you can see around here has a ratio that's below a percent. So the first order, we can just neglect everybody except here. Um, when the atoms are trapped above the waveguide like this, the waveguide is coming out, then what happens if you go along the waveguide? Well, we're near the bandage for all the experiments I'm going to describe. Uh, certainly better than a percent, much better than a percent. And so the block mode is essentially a cosine squared. So there's no coupling here. Gamma 1D is spatially modulated as you go along like this. So that's the setting in which now I want to tell you about measurements. We send light in and out. Atoms are trapped here. We can send light in. We can look at reflection. We can send light through. We can look at the transmission. That's what I want to tell you about. A little bit more about the trap, though. This is the beam coming out of the page at you. It's very important to understand Casimir Polder that this looks like we didn't do the calculation very well or had too much coffee. Every one of those points takes a part of a day to, fill, to calculate. It's Casimir Polder using numerical techniques that were developed at MIT by uh, Steve Johnson and his colleagues. And um, so we have to calculate that. So the wobbles are, OK, how long do you want to wait? Well, I'm, I want to see the answer, Chin Lung. So Chin Lung uh, Hung calculated all this. And so here's the trapping potential. It's about 100 microkelvin in its weakest direction. And that's because of this corner. So that's the Casimir Polder. So you got to think about, OK, finally we want to go inside, but these corners are, are where you die. Uh, in the other two directions, along here and along here, the trap's pretty stiff. This is about 100 microkelvin. This is a few hundred microkelvin. So we're okay. And in the, in the, all the measurements, and I'll show you the kind of absolute agreement of everything, says the atoms are trapped like this, just as I've drawn it. Uh, trap lifetime is about 30 milliseconds, which, for, you know, for a circuit QED guy or a ion trapper is like, come on, come back and tell us about it when it's serious, like 30 days. Uh, but that's pretty good for us because the transit time of a, of a 20 microkelvin atom through the device is a microsecond. So we're pretty happy to see these tens of milliseconds. So the measurement is go to the band edge. Here's the, the transmission. It, these are these uh, resonances from the tapers, and then the transmission goes to zero. At this last, actually first resonance from the band edge, which has this enhancement of about uh, reflectivity of about 40%, uh, look right there, the group index is about 11, the cavity enhancement is about 4, so this is, the enhancement is dominated by the waveguide physics, not the cavity physics. And let's measure transmission, so you just send light in and look at light out, look at the reflection, and the points of the measurement. This is the transmission normalized here, no atoms, scan the frequency, and then put atoms in and scan the frequency. And from the, the uh, measurements like this, we can infer that this is taken with about two atoms trapped along. We, we load, and we don't know if we load, you know. It's stochastic, so we don't do one, two, three yet. But uh, that's what we have. And the gamma 1D over gamma prime, this is to all other channels, uh, free space and lossy modes and, say, another TM mode. So that's what we get. And uh, that lets us infer from this gamma 1D, it lets us infer the reflectivity is about, for one atom, is about 50%. If we could just put one atom there and the transmission coefficient, one atom would attenuate by about four times. So that's in the, in the frequency domain, scan of frequency looking at the, essentially the susceptibility. 
Let's look in the time domain, trap atoms, and then flash them and watch them decay. <clears throat> For reference, this is log scale, so exponential decay, straight line. If a cesium atom on the D1 line were in free space, we'd see a decay of 35 nanoseconds. And if we go uh, to long time, so the trap lifetime is about 30 milliseconds. If we go to long trap lifetimes, then we see predominantly effective single atom. If you look at decay curves like this at 60, 70 milliseconds, you, you extract a lifetime, and, and it's always the same. And it's, it says that gamma 1D or gamma prime is about 1. So that's the one atom uh, decay rate. And now if you go, OK, I'm not going to wait to long times, load this most atoms you can get in this structure and look at the decay rate. And you just draw a straight line. And it's about, uh, t you can see it's faster. It's about three times faster. That tells you n's about 2. So it's pretty straightforward to see that as you increase the number of atoms, the, the uh, decay rate's increasing. And um, so that's cooperative emission. So we can fit not just a straight line. We can fit better that we really know that you know, it's uh, some fluctuating number. We assume a Poisson. You can fit. You can pull out what n and gamma 1 d are. And then as a function of decay time of the trap, not the decay time of the light, you can see that this n bar that we infer goes down fine as a lifetime in this case of 20 milliseconds or something like that. From these fits, you can infer that that, that ratio. Um, from this analysis, you can get uh, what is the ratio of the total decay rate to gamma 0 versus the mean number of atoms. And uh, 2 is meant to be the one atom rate. You go smaller and smaller and smaller. And finally, there's just one atom or nothing. If there's nothing, we see no counts. And so we get about 2. So that means there's one unit of loss elsewhere and one unit of uh, into the waveguide. You can do this versus hold time, or you can, it, you, that is, they decay just because of the trap lifetime, or you can just load fewer in the beginning, and you get the same answer in both cases. So this observation we claim of super radiance for atoms trapped along the waveguide. Um, you can uh, try to say, OK, it, gamma 1D is about 1. Gamma prime is 1.1. Uh, you can say, oh, how's that agree with, that's the structure. Take that SEM of the whole thing, uh, digitize it, put it into a finite element calculation, and calculate the Green's function for atomic emission into this thing. So this is no adjustable parameter. It's cesium uh, and that electron micrograph of the whole thing. And then ask as a function of atomic frequency, that is, if the atomic frequency were moving relative to a fixed structure, this is the imaginary part. These are frequency shifts. This is a, r a real part. This is the imaginary part of the Green's function. We sit right here for these measurements, so there's no frequency shift to within about a megahertz. And, uh, and then we say that the, at that frequency where the graphs I just showed you were taken, we should have a total decay rate of about 2.2 times gamma zero. And if you look here, 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 and you go in the band gap, that level is, OK, the waveguide physics turned off, so that's what we call gamma prime into everywhere else. And so that's fine. That's what one atom ought to do. I told you we think we have cooperative emission. So if there's more than one atom, what do you expect? Two atoms excited, how are they going to emit? This is the Green's function. Uh, as a function of atomic separation, it goes like this. As they go farther and farther apart, the rate uh, goes away from this value of, of uh, uh, close to 1. So that is the dipole-dipole two-point Green's function. And this curve is just what you expect because we're getting near the ends of a finite crystal. We're beginning to get long, longer, and we see that a uh, finite crystal. So that's uh, made us all pretty happy. Measurement says that we get this gamma 1D about 1.1, and you can see here it's about 1. So that's at like a 10% level. We know absolutely what I told you. The atoms are trapped where you would calculate. The structure has a geometry we know. We plug that in to the screen's function calculation. And, and we know what we're doing. And that's, been, that's a big relief after several years of, of not knowing what we're doing. So what are we trying to do now? We're trying to uh, transport the atoms into the center of the unit cells. If we, we're trapped here now, this is the waveguide coming out of the page at you. And if we move the atom to here, this gamma 1D will go up by 5. So how are we going to do that? So the gamma 1D will go from 1 to 5 in the last experiment. This is a frame from a movie that John Hood made, which says if you're trapped here in, in the trap I just showed you, and now you turn on a guided mode, 
uh, two guided modes, one a red, one a blue, you can deform this trap adiabatically and just suck in the movie. The atoms trapped here stable, and then you just adiabatic transfer there. So that's what we're trying to do now to move them into the center of that. And at least in mathematics, it works great. Uh, so one of the goals that I mentioned in passing about uh, you know two regimes, dispersive and reactive, in the in the propagating band and in the band gap. And so we want to do that. You'll hear again uh, more about that in the talks at the end of the day. To do find out what's happening when our atoms go into the band gap, the frequency goes to the band gap, where well, we can't see these spectra. So this is just the device profile here. And it's oscillating. This this last resonance. And so we took measurements there. This is a TM mode. So we built structures where we can efficiently propagate TE and TM out of the structures. And these are just the, these wiggles are just parasitic reflections. The TM mode knows nothing about a band edge. So now we can make a measurement here and ask, OK, what does the TE think? That's the one that knows about all this uh, band edge physics, and the TM doesn't know anything. So you can make measurements like that. This is now we're not on the cavity resonance, so we see these dispersive shifts for the atom. Um, and uh, that's what the TM mode means, a reasonable signal for a couple of atoms. And what does the T, TE know? And what does the TM, which doesn't know anything about the band edge, it looks like that. And if you overlay those, then you get a graph like that. So the plan is, OK, from here we can extract the gamma 1D, and, which is supposed to go to 0 when we go to the band edge. We can extract the frequency shift, which is not supposed to go to 0. That's just going to be atom-atom uh, dipole uh, shifts as we go through, and we've got this TM mode as our calibrator that we can see when you go in the band. So we, we have a plan. Uh, so back to this, uh, what are we trying to do uh, more te in technical terms? Getting into the band gap now has this kind of Hamiltonian I described. And th there's nice physics. The way we tune into the gap is just like cesium deposit. It makes this structure a little bit thicker, shifts the band edge, and moves the, the band edge down and moves cesium, which is fixed, into the, into the gap. So it would be nice to have a knob to do that. So how do you have a knob which goes from you know, this regime, to, let's go back, goes from this regime to that regime? Uh, it would be nice if I could turn it. It would also be nice if you could turn it in, in, a, in a microsecond, which we think we'll be able to do. And so we've been working on that. That's led by uh, Su Ping Yu. This is the alligator, and the, and the idea is just grab it on either side and pull it apart. And if you change the gap, the band structure, the, the band gap stays about the same, but the band edges move. And so that's the structure that Su Ping has made. This is its functional thing. This is all suspended on the alligator, and this is fixed to you know uh, Mother Earth. This is, uh, and so you apply a voltage, and the thing tunes. And the proof of that is just apply a voltage and plot versus the square of that. This is just electrostatic tuning. So we can move over a large range, uh, a couple of nanometers. We, we can now localize the device band edge relative to cesium to a few parts, of, of, of like um, 3 to the minus 3. And, and then we tune it uh, to, I don't know, part 10 to the 6 or something. Anyway, so this will be nice in terms of dynamically tuning. We want to look at dynamics where it's dissipative or, or, uh, or Hamiltonian and tune in and out of the gap. The other thing we've been working on are cavities. So this is called fishbone cavity. So this is a variant of the alligator. Makes a reflector here. And so this is just with a single nanobeam, this cavity. And uh, you measure transmission, uh, reflection. You get these really narrow lines. You take the ratio. You get the cavity Q. We measure Quality factors are about a million. Um, so we're getting pretty good at that. That means the loss over the length, this is now a single beam, but we want to build alligators of this. For, so just single beam, we've got the process controlled down so that we have a, a few parts to 10 to the minus 4 and 100 microns. That's the length of our alligators. So propagation loss is just not going to be part of the problem in these experiments. Uh, let me quickly just remind you of a recent paper that's uh, by Alejandro Gonzalez Tudela and Chin Lung. Um, which I think is really important in terms of extending all these ideas to, to real two-dimensional structures. We have band gap, band structure, we have band gaps. We've designed it so we can trap and we can do physics, uh, the strong interaction and a band edge, and has applications to you know, quantum magnetism, both in and out of the gap. Uh, we think we can do topological stuff 
Uh, we have a manuscript we're preparing about that to essentially realize any uh, quantum spin Hamiltonian. Uh, the basic idea I'll just run over is, you know, this is the cartoon, but we've really designed how you track this thing. It's a lambda system, so you go up and you go down, so this is going to be exciting ground states, and the guided modes interact here. Um, and so you get a spin-spin Hamiltonian of your favorite flavor. We can tune these coefficients, both the magnitude and the functional form. Uh, the interesting thing is how big is it? The functional form, we now think we can, this is some Bessel function, looks like a log, it looks like, you know, what do you want? Uh, if you have some money, we'll make what you want. Um, and this thing, how big is it? Well, it depends on stuff about the device. So depending on the band curvature, um, how flat the bands are, the rate gets up higher and higher and higher as the bands get flatter. And so for the device that we designed, which is completely reasonable to build, it's fairly conservative, we think we can make this gamma 2D, which is the 2D analog of this 1D, we can make that kind of 30 megahertz. So smaller, uh, uh, if we can make flatter curvature, uh, then we can do better. Um, let's see, here. So it, putting all that together, we want to do spin-spin physics. How, how, lo how long can we do spin-spin physics before we, we make a mistake? We dissipate a photon. So this is the number of coherent cycles. And you can see in the device we designed, if you put the atoms in the trap site, we already take gamma 1D down, gamma prime, the loss down to 0.4, and we can do tens of cycles. Not very good. If we're able to improve, we've got 10 to the 6 for Qs. If we go up 10 to the 7th, that's in the literature. Uh, 10 to the 8th is kind of heroic. But we ought to be able to make this thing a lot better and make flatter bands. Uh, Chin Lung Hung has already designed a 1D structure where that's, that's true. So... We hope, and following Peter Lodel, the talk he showed, that we can get this well down below 0.1, then, then we can do hundreds of cycles. If we make really flat bands by looking at topological properties of, uh, of uh, photonic crystals, then if we can get this down another factor of 10, then we're doing 10,000. And then it's just, it just changes the future, I think, of uh, the spin-spin physics. Okay, uh, just quickly, here's a photonic crystal, and if you look at Casimir Polder, it's big here and small here, big here and small here above these posts, and so you can use the modulation in Casimir Polder to make traps on really small scales. Why would you want to do that? Because conventional optical lattices live out here for, say, Bose-Hubbard physics. The rates you get in these lattices are really small. Uh, that's why it's so heroic to, you know, very low temperatures, low entropy. And if you go into one of these so-called vacuum lattices where the trap, where the length scale can go way below the, the um, the wavelength, then we think you can really push up the coupling rates. So, okay, let me thank the whole group. Uh, thank you for your attention. We have one new student, and it's clear that he needs to be retrained as well. Uh, thanks. So polarization is a big deal, and uh, the, all the devices we've designed so far around the trap site have a, a, a dominant linear polarization for both the trap, it, it, it's, it's linearly polarized the trap site, and the guided mode. And then um, what you'd like to do, so that's nice, so we don't, we don't um, in atomic physics, you have any ellipticity, then you get a, a magnetic field, a pseudo-magnetic field. And... So that's not good. So we've designed them like that. We've avoided all this stuff that you heard about for chiral photons that require elliptical, circularly polarized light. So that's really good. Bad is, look, these structures support this and that. They're not really good with linearly polarized light, a uh, circularly polarized light. So if you want to use guided modes like that, then you have to say, well, this is the trap side, and that's, that's what I'll call Z. And this guy in that language then is a co linear combination of sigma plus sigma minus. So one idea that you can get started with is simply you, you, you define, say, in the ground state of rubidium that plus one and minus one is the qubit, linear superposition. And then you can talk to it with that polarization. That's a little tricky, it seems to me. So how well can we illuminate the thing externally? 
and preserve the circular polarization inside the trap, we don't know. So the, the other way is just try to do it externally. But that's a real, uh, that's a problem. And so you can spend lots of nights with clever ideas, and I don't think we have the one that says this, you know, this is the killer. That's what we're working on. The planet. It does. So because we have linearly polarized light, and for if you're in the ground state of the trap, say, which I think is fairly straightforward to cool to, and these, the, the frequencies are pretty high. Uh, we have anharmonicity in the trap we can use for stuff. But anyway, the, the comment I just made to Vlad is in the local region around the trap site, it's, it's that polarization. And so when you move... The, for example, you know, along a nanofiber, if you diagonalize this stuff, you get what are called the adiabatic states. And so locally there's an M sub F, but it's rotating as you move. This trap is not like that. It's, that's the Zeeman number. And so it's not just the, the... Anyway, so that's the answer to the question. It's just what you would hope for in free, free space if you localize it around the, you know, the trap minimum. It's not kind of. It it, it's each each side gets one atom. You're not going to get two. No. So you can load one or zero. So the the kind of uh, history of this atomic physics is people making you know really tightly focused optical tweezers, so the kind of a lambda cubed, and then trying to load them. Up, uh, uh, Philippe Granger, one of the pioneers in that, and noticing that, you, you know, you only could get zero or one. And that's because, well, you didn't load it. Well, try harder, and then you, and when two come in, there's a light and cystic collision that blows them out. So uh, for a long time, there was this roadblock of getting it, uh, just zero or one. So you get 50% loading. And then um, a group, um, Andrew Wilson, maybe, if I've got that right, in New Zealand showed that you can, by just shining a laser on it's trivial. You, you, you do something about that collision. And, and Cindy Regal has recently shown at Boulder in four atom traps, four, four tweezers. So you can get 90% for each tweezer. And so I think what we'll be able to do fairly simply is load 90% of the sites. It really doesn't matter, though, because uh, the sites are pi apart if you're near the band edge. Or if you're inside the band gap, they're pi apart. The block function is pi. So when a, uh, this atom goes, emits and goes back, uh, the, that's two pi round trip, so it doesn't really matter. So that nothing I told you changes. The sign of the block function changes, but you, you, you count for that. So for, it really doesn't matter that this thing is densely loaded to 99.9%. To .9%. That's what, If we get 90%, then any of the spin physics is fine in the end. And I think we'll be able to by following these steps that these other groups have, have shown. For the 1D structure, it doesn't matter if, if they're trapped at, uh, here or here. That in the, in the, you know, for the general statement, that's true. In some particular cases, if you really had spin-spin things that, that had a length scale of a unit, then you would matter. Yeah, that would matter. But for our things, they're going to be pretty long range. In 2D structures, I think this trick still works of uh, this collision blockade. What's hard. In the, the, for number one, uh, the, the atoms are trapped much more deeply, so they can't tunnel. One of the things that's a problem in Cindy's experiment is that as you bring them together, the weak direction, it's two tweezers, so as you bring them like that, then the weak direction is along this direction, and that allows the atoms to hop. We don't want that to happen. We don't want hopping in this, this, the first story. And so the, our trap is really deep along that direction, both in 1 and 2D. The reason it doesn't work in 3D is because I think it'll work in 2D. In 3D, you can't cool, uh, say, a, to BEC like that because there's nowhere for these photons to go. 
So one way of getting, you know, the 2D geometry is the one that you, you show. Is, is there any way of, like, I don't know, putting some of these uh, alligators, like, crossing each other? Or there's no way of getting to more than one key by doing this? <laughs> well, I've had some good wine figuring that out, yeah, and, uh, you know, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I have some ideas, but uh, it, it, it's not completely obvious. You know, we, we have designs now where we can do this Carl stuff, so that's interesting in 1D. And, uh, and how does that look in 2D, I don't know. But, but the, the, the kind of first order story of we're just getting started, so you've got to build a structure where you can trap atoms in a way where you know what's going on. You don't have this goofy polarization wandering all over the place, nothing traps, why not? So it's hard enough to adapt, you know, cooling and trapping into this micro and nano environment. So, so I have ideas, are they going to be any good? But yeah, I think there are different ways to do it, and ultimately even to maybe build 3D structures. 